Welcome back. The final lecture of the day concerns open learning ecosystems. Mike Bernd is head of the content and team coordinator for learning opportunities at the AI campus of the Stifterverband, a joint initiative of companies and foundation providing holistic advice in the areas of education, science and innovation. And I welcome him live to the studio. Uh, thanks for being here, Mike Bernd. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, my name is Mike Bernd and I'm really happy to be here today to talk about our project, the AI Campus, an open learning ecosystem. And uh, we have a broad vision. I think this is something which can be discussed afterwards because we want nothing less than to have an AI competent society. What that means we will hear uh, from now on. So what are we, what is the AI campus? Basically the AI campus is part of a digital and AI strategy of the German government. We are a so-called research and development project. So we started with a small ecosystem, which is step-by-step -step growing into something bigger with, with some deeper meaning and with this broad outreach um, um, the societal outreach I already stated. And um, yeah, we are, we started with our project in October 2019 and we have a second funding period. We are about to start in January uh, in, uh, until 2024 and then we see how it goes further. Until then, until the end of uh, 24, uh, 2024, we want to educate more than 100,000 people when it comes to artificial intelligence, data literacy and data science. Um, to reach this, basically, we developed some guiding principles, uh, a so-called uh, mission or mission statements, uh, we could say. And one of the main things basically is point one and point six, which is kind of interconnected. And this means that we want to create some sort of interoperability when it comes to learning ecosystems. So we don't want to be just one ecosystem. We want to connect uh, educational institutions, universities, higher education institutions to basically become something bigger, what we like to call smart learning environment. Um, and this is basically uh, technical wise. So we have a website and a learning management system, but even the whole content we are creating, it, it doesn't matter if it's videos, text elements, programming exercises, everything regarded learning, that's basically point six, is based on open educational resources as well. What this OER mean basically, it means that all teachers, learners can use these videos, they can remix these videos and they can can basically bring it into the world. It's completely open. Yeah. Um, within our ecosystem, uh, this is basically point two, uh, we want to we want to create learning processes which are not from the perspective of the teacher or the professors. We want to basically bring the learners into the driver's seat. So we want to make engaging videos, engaging environments. We want to show why learners are learning something. Um, and uh, this is definitely connected to uh, what we call instructional design to make some sort of individual learning journey, individual learning pathway, specializations that someone, that a learner uh, kind of experiences what he likes to learn and then he moves ahead as he likes to. And there we want to make this whole environment not just one straight path, like one curriculum. It's really something where you can look ref left or right and then move ahead as you like. That's basically this user-oriented uh, product development. We always want to be even if we are like a digital learning platform, we always want to be in some sort of way in contact with our learners um, when it comes to learning analytics. But we also go to universities and talk to students, for example, to get in touch with them, to kind of get a feeling what they like to learn, what they need to learn. And based on this, we further, we further develop our ecosystem. So basically, uh, that's what we want with the AI campus, we want to promote um, uh, data literacy skills, uh, data science skills and AI skills on a broad scale and even get more people interested into the topic. How we do this, we want to talk in their language. Uh, um, so if we are basically working on an academic level, we want to use their language and we want to, if we want to 
reach the people for example with a podcast series on the street then we we try to to bring this into our uh, product development design and 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 basically what's the result what what's the end of the thing is we want to basically make people aware uh, when they are using ai based uh, ai based te technologies or ai based uh, applications we want them to understand to question them on an ethical level as well and maybe like even design ai systems at a certain stage uh, we produce our own content with our learning platform together that's another approach we we aim together with content partners universities uh, um, um, uh, educational institutions um, and bring it like as ai campus originals on our campus but at the same time we are always curating stuff we are looking what's already in the world what's already open source in the in the world and bring it on our platform so and that's where we are at the moment uh, we we see and that's basically we want to create a holistic learning environment holistic learning that means not only lectures we want to reach people like with low level low threshold uh, content like uh, like youtube videos for example and there we are already uh, quite successful with more than 1.5 million views we have more than uh, five, 400,000 people on our on our uh, website and we have more and more people like 18,000 profiles already in our online courses um, what are our target groups as I said like we want to have an AI competent society so we not only aim for students we, we are mainly aiming for students at the moment but we step by step try to opening up to, to get all the lifelong learners like uh, at, at the first place professionals for reskilling for upskilling uh, purposes but the same as like seniors yeah like uh, uh, pensioners uh, uh, lifelong learners we want to get them everywhere we, we can and use all sorts of different formats it starts what we call learning nuggets this can be videos this can be podcasts like engaging quizzes for example or games like lab experiments this we all have like on our web page and uh, underneath this first web page you can basically enroll to online courses in a learning management system and there you can really create this uh, uh, really go through this online courses and get some sort of certificate which is acknowledged uh, for example in some at some universities or you can use it basically for uh, your professional development and uh, a next step we want to go together with all these institutions we are working together with uh, to develop some sort of micro degrees where you can basically specialize there for the specialization uh, programs and that's something which is really important for us that as i said all the content we have like it's uh, a ccbysa um, a license it's absolutely free to use remixable and um, um, yeah you can bring it into the world and there you basically see the step how we want to bring the people into our content so we we started some sort of like on social media like linkedin or twitter um, with uh, some sort of information formats to basically get people interested in our into our topics and then they can do step by step a deep dive they can can listen to our podcasts and then go deeper and doing our MOOCs and maybe then enroll at a, a university or some sort of further education programs to get qualifications or certifications um who are we as i said like we are all we are just developing through collaboration and this is why the Stifterverband, that's basically where I'm from, we built a consortium and the consortium is uh, working on three levels, basically content and research, tech, and our so-called application partners. And the application partners, they come into play uh, during our uh, AI Campus 2.0 period, which start in January. Um, and the application partners, they have basically they have to create some sort of open uh, open lectures for example to bring to bring uh, like the society into the universities or, or the charité to focus basically not on only on their own students but maybe also like doctors practitioners already working out there in the world and need to be upskilled with more and more ai based uh, applications coming into their lives um 
And we also do this on an international level, like on, on something we, uh, which is called the European MOOC Consortium. These are basically all the huge uh, European uh, MOOC platforms developing uh, 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 MOOCs and, and online courses all over, all over Europe. And this, you can have like a, a, a network we already built up. It's quite small, uh, but it gives you an impression, for example, so the deep green uh, partners, they are really developing content together with us or for us, which we bring into our ecosystem. At the same time, we have in the light blue, with the light blue labels, we have lots of institutions who are basically using our digital content into their lectures and bring it, uh, bring it into blended learning formats, uh, uh, bring it into the universities, into workshop formats all over uh, Germany, uh, uh, Luxembourg now, and alre already Switzerland as well. And um, maybe just have a quick look into, into the topic of uh, AI and health and medicine, what we are doing at the moment. Um, uh, we are creating a, an, an online series and a podcast series, for example, which is produced together with the Charité in, uh, over here in Berlin. And what we see at the moment is these, these um, online courses, they are the, the materials in there are already being used at different universities like the University of Mainz or like the University Hospital in Basel uh, to create this, um, uh, this, uh, on, uh, this lectures. Uh, this lectures on AI in medicine. Uh, we have further education programs as well, uh, together with the State Medical Chamber of Baden-Württemberg, where we really have doctors like all over Germany who can collect their uh, continual medication points with our online courses. So they are already fully certified. And we have, as I said, like this blended learning projects uh, in uh, which are more and more like popping up uh, over Germany. We have further upcoming courses as well. So we start with specializations, for example, uh, not only in medicine, but also in health. So we kind of opening up yeah? um, and uh, like uh, health prevention, for example, or like really like where we go in more in depth when it comes to radiology, for example, or like ophthalmology, which is happening together with the University Hospital in Bonn. Just um, um, and, and final, let me uh, show you how you can learn basically on the AI campus within this uh, learning a ecosystem. We have a landing page, it's on uh, www.aicampus.org. There you can uh, register absolutely for free. And then you have an overview like with all the content, the micro content, the videos, and then there of course you can go and learn within our courses as well. Yeah, that's basically our mission. You can all, participate, just get enrolled and get started and uh, learn more about what we need to know about data and uh, AI and become data and AI literate. Thank you very much for this interesting keynote. Uh, maybe we can sit yeah. um, and... Yeah, so you have talked about um, You've maybe also more elaborated about what open source can be, how open source can be scaled in your <coughs> institution, um, and also elaborated upon data literacy. Now, Bart and I, we've also talked about data literacy. You have some, um, you have your own views on what data literacy should be. Maybe I wanted to engage you in the conversation <coughs> about that because that is something that I was always wondering. Um, that is a buzzword. We always hear data literacy. Um, what does that actually mean for you in your practice? And maybe also uh, because we have talked about the concept of data literacy, how does this relate to Bart's concept? That's basically really a tough, to st uh, tough question, <laughs> and uh, we could start discussion right now. Yes. I think, like, because, like, where, yeah, what is data literacy? And then we also have like data science, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where does data science start? So for, for me, basically, data literacy, we, um, it's it's the first step within the world of data. I would say, yeah, but data. We we don't collect data since yesterday, since we are using computers. Yeah, uh, data is being collected. Like, uh, I'm I'm basically quite in touch with China, and uh, they are collecting data quite structurally for thousands and thousands of years. Yeah, mm -hmm. and bring it together. Yeah, and. Uh, 
data literacy is basically how this is being done. Yeah? And when it comes to, uh, to, 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 to data literacy in the computer age, I would say like it's, for example, what is good data and bad data, yeah? which data, for example, can be used to develop some sort of algorithms. Yeah? There, there you have basically, yeah, so, so it's hard for, for example, mm -hmm. what you wrote down yeah, mm -hmm. to bring it like into the computer uh, and uh, develop some sort of algorithm. Yeah? It needs to be uh, digitalized. Yeah? Yes, yeah. yes. And it also relates to what you said to an AI competent society, right? That is, I mean, one of the main goals of, of your organization. And um, I just want to relate that you, you have of, in your talk related that to our topic, to health and healthcare. Um, and I was particularly keen to hear more about, the, um, about your work with the Charité. Uh, you mentioned you have a podcast series. What do you... What do you talk about in your podcasts with the Charité? So we really, so basically we are already in our third series uh, within the podcast. So in the first series, we really started to, to basically kind of elaborate uh, on a certain, certain tem terminology when it, comes to, mm -hmm. when it comes to artificial intelligence. So for example, what is deep learning? What is machine learning? And, but always connected, like problem-based connected to a certain use case. For mm -hmm. example, yeah, deep learning when it comes to computational neuroscience mm -hmm. yeah, or um, 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 and, and there we, we looked into different fields of medicine and how uh, AI methodology is be, being used in certain contexts. Mm -hmm. yeah? And in, in the uh, third uh, um, series, we, we really start to bring back these use cases and try to, to put the perspective of ethical kind of correct use of these. Uh, uh, so, for example, if I use a symptom checker app mm -hmm. yeah, and I... And, and there is some sort of deep learning in it, yeah. Um, and I, I have a black box, yeah. How do I know that mm -hmm. the, the diagnosis basically I get from this uh, symptom checker app mm -hmm. is correct or not? Because I don't know how it comes to the results. Yeah. And this is something we try to elaborate now in in the in the third uh, uh, season, and this is where we want to go on. Mm -hmm. But to get to the point, and maybe this is something we can discuss as well, to to discuss something on an ethical level, mm -hmm. you basically already need some sort of education. You need to know something about it, yeah? what it's about. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And this is basically, we wanted to bring the people there in the first two series and then in the third, basically to see, is it possibly good or bad? Can it be used or not? Or if it's being used by someone, what should, to, should be put into consideration? Yeah, so education really stands at the center also of yeah. data literacy. Maybe Bart, what is what is your um, what is your uh, concept of data literacy? Um, first, I want to because we discussed digital literacy. Oh yes, we did. Yeah? We did. Uh, so, which is a, a bit of a yeah. broader term, yeah. but like uh, we're talking about education. Remember when you learn languages, it's not a binary. You know French or you don't know French. It's you have levels. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to look at this yeah. in, in literacy in the same way. We have levels of literacy. And we talk so about we need to improve digital literacy as it's something binary that suddenly you know everything. And um, what, what we need is continuous learning. And uh, the world is going to change faster. These AIs are going to more, have more influence. And um, I don't know if people are familiar with the five Cs of, of the 21st century, which is about critical thinking, is about collaboration, is about communication. There are, there are things we can prepare ourselves for for this very fast-moving world. Like in Berlin, and in Vienna recently, the mayor stuck to a fake um, 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 a Klitschko. I don't know if you, if people saw that. <laughs> yeah. That tells something about the literacy. You know, it was not even a deep fake. It was a cheap fake. It was a, <laughs> a it, it was a, 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 a version of Klitschko with a, an over voice done, and they didn't even notice. Like the the mayor of of, of uh, Vienna tweeted, like, "Thank you for the nice conversation." Like, like. The, the level of literacy that we have in, in, a, in a, with a mayor of a city is, it seems to be not that high to be able to, 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 yeah, to be critical enough about the things what you see. And I think the world is going to change really fast with the things that we see, the things that we hear, because suddenly we are confronted with uh, synthetic things, like synthetic people, synthetic voices, synthetic things, because we are democratizing it. And, um, and people are afraid of the democratization, but like it's, 
I think we need to prepare these things, and and that's why I find this initiative, what you guys are doing, or initiative, like it's, it's not even a project, it's going to be one of the pillars that we need in society, and it should be accessible to all, like everybody should have that ability. And so like in, in German, you, you say like, uh, I don't know how, there's not really a good world word in, in, in English for that, but like that you are triggered by f uh, foreign forces, like that, mm -hmm. that by iron for example um i'm not going to say which person in my family but like <laughs> um um like we have table conversations and um um that person has uh, facebook and the facebook is connected to the apple watch and she get headline news and then so triggered by an algorithm our conversation at the table are being interrupted by reading a headline and then she's going in rage like, what is it happened and everything else like it's crazy. Like our real world is being triggered by an algorithm, and and I think, so literacy goes even in that far that you have to understand why you are getting enraged because um, mm -hmm. then you need to understand why headlines are creating these sentiments, and you need to understand the commercial model. So for me, this concept goes way further um, than just data or AI literacy because these are powerful tools. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned in my keynote, these tools are being used to increase businesses or have a purpose that are actually always abusing our paleolithic emotions. We are stuck in the Middle Ages with our body. We cannot augment ourselves in that sense and we need to deal with these things. So uh, we need way more, I think, than just uh, creating digital consumers. Mm -hmm. And that's what digital literacy or data literacy should not be like, um, that you don't, that you are, are, are a consumer of that. Uh, and I give to give that more context and then uh, uh, shut up. But like, um, like when we had these um, uh, discussions in Germany about um, installing computers in schools or giving access to tablets. And I said like, why do we want to buy all commercial tablets? Why let not these children build their own tablets? Because you can buy all the pieces together and, and, and make them aware how these things function. And that's for me literacy. Mm -hmm. It's not so difficult to build your own tablet today. Like you, you can do that by YouTube, like uh, talking about literacy. And I think these things need to, to drive and, and, and we need to create content that you give access um, to but these things. Don't you, sorry, I have to ask yeah. a question yeah. now, yeah? but don't you think this is not already more than just being literate when you can really create something new? I think this is already quite an expert knowledge you can already apply at some stage. Well, you lived in China mm -hmm. and, and I think in China they are going much faster <laughs> in that yeah. direction where they teach the children exactly yeah. to do that. Right. Right? And, and we are, I don't like these geopolitical competitions that are driven by ideologies, but um, like if you see what's happening in China, the, the youth is being exactly trained in that way. They, they learn how to build, they have maker spaces and 3D printing and build their own things. Like if I teach my children, yes, I, I want to learn them how to think logically, program and, and build these things because I think they will be more competitive. And then we need to, of course, differentiate between kids and then um, mature people about digital and data literacy, which also perhaps has a because the kids are going to grow up in a world that, that it is, we don't even can imagine, but it, yeah. there's going to be a lot of abuse of these powerful technologies. And then I, I want my kids to be able to build these things themselves. Or, or at least can reflect on it. Because I, I really like the example of language learning, mm -hmm. because this is really like when, when you are on the lowest level, you just start, you, you are not able, you just know, know a few words or sentence. You can't reflect basically on the, on the language when it comes to does this word have like a positive or a negative connotation. Yes. You have, need to have some sort of level to be, get, become more and more competent to, to learn even to understand more about the culture which is in yes. there, for example, yeah? and and to to kind of learn, yeah, is this this is this a swear word which he's using? Is he try yeah. or she trying to insult me now, or is it just being ironic in some sort of way or sarcastic or to get through all this? And there you need to have different levels. I wouldn't say that we all need to be become absolutely <coughs> native speakers when it comes mm -hmm. to this, yeah? But I think we should get to a stage where we can make a competent use yes. of, of the language. 
That's interesting. The 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 whole um, model talking about language is is very interesting to me because earlier today we heard a keynote uh, by Tamar Sharon, a philosopher, um, who was also talking about values. And now you've mentioned language, and you've said um, if I learn a word, I also need to um, know how to apply that word. That's a cultural question. That's also a question. Maybe you can also uh, relate to that very very well if you have lived in China. That's a question of also understanding understanding values in, in, in cultural differences. Um, now, concerning values with our topic of health and healthcare and data uh, literacy, we've earlier talked about big tech and big med tech. We had this conversation about um, how... A big pharma. Big med tech, big pharma, yes. Big tech. <laughs> um, and big tech. Um, and there, to me, there is, um, as Tamar Sharon was also elaborating, there is a new set of values being brought to health and healthcare by big players who are shaping how we see things, who are shaping our culture. Yeah. And um, maybe this is also a question for Bart at first, and then we can open yeah. it up. Um, to you, is there a big difference between big tech and big pharma? What do you think is, who is the most important um, sector to look at? Which sector is the most important I, I, now? I hate, I, I hate competition in that sense, so who is the most important? Um, but but thank you for that question. <laughs> but I, I, I think, let me perhaps do it differently and answer this differently. What do they have in common? And then perhaps I, I find a better answer. I think they both have in common that we have uh, in healthcare this uh, problem of growth in the economy. Like, um, if you see the US healthcare system that grew 4% GDP points in 15 years on healthcare, where one fifty of the economy is healthcare. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, people are getting bankrupt because they can't pay for their healthcare bills. Mm -hmm. Like 60% of the personal bankruptcies in the US are because of health uh, bills, healthcare bills. And, and, and a lot of people are falling out of the system. So continuously growth is, 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 is perhaps quite challenging. And you have seen this in the US with insulin prices where the patent was sold for $1 in 99 years ago. Mm. In the last 10 years, the prices went up by 1,200%. Now, I understand these companies that they have the pressure for growth because now there was this fake tweet from Ella Lilly and, the, and they said like the fake tweet was with, related with Twitter, but it said like, uh, oh, we're going to give insulin for free and suddenly the stock dropped. Um, and it shows that these companies are instantly under pressure to always deliver more. And then I ask myself, where does this end? And tech has the same thing. If 20% of the industry in the US is healthcare, they're going to dig into healthcare to grow. And, and I think that's what they have in common. They, they have this continuous push to grow. And if we make this out, and that's what, why I'm going for that open, if we think that we do this on the scarcity model, then people are going to start to fall out and we're going to see more and more inequality. We're going to see more and more people not being able to afford. Last week, the first gene therapy for hemophilia blood disease was released with a price of 3.5 million for one single therapy. These are exorbitant prices that nobody can afford anymore. So, But these are based on the growth factors, what the industry has. And I think I, I would not differentiate them, but I would put them both in the same thing that we are in healthcare, we should not go or we should ask ourselves the question is healthcare an industry that we want to grow or is it something that we want to break down the costs so more people get access and we get it more democratized and we break down costs uh, because that's what I know from technology my, mm. my, my, my telephone has a, a compute power of a great supercomputer that costed millions and the price went down. In healthcare, prices go up and I think we need to break this. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, of course. I mean, that's pretty interesting because he knows all this stuff yes. because, yeah, he's in touch with it like every day, like 24-7 yeah. more or less, yeah. And the question is like, what's with the people out in the world? Yeah. Yeah? Because like all these big tech players, uh, um, they create narratives which show us like a, a brave new world yes. with them as the key players mm -hmm. and this is why we need to educate people to see through these things and being like uh, reflected and and as critical maybe as you are or or maybe like even can like see the pros and cons of using 
using mm -hmm. like uh, stuff being developed by them. Yes, this yeah. is what you meant maybe earlier when you were saying that you want to put your learners into the driver's seat. Exactly. Yes, yes. Yeah. okay. Uh -huh. Now, but, um, it, it, Sorry, but mm -hmm. this is where we see the need like to mm -hmm. really not reach certain parts of a society because they all are going to use sooner or later mm -hmm. these uh, sort of applications or technology. This mm. is really, we, we really need this broad outreach in, in some sort of way and educate like as many people as we can. Can, can mm -hmm. I pick on that? Um, there is this book from Julie Tse, which is, um, 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 it's called Corpus Delicti and it's, uh, it's already more than 10 years old and it goes in this dictate of health because of the, the technology that is there that all people are monitored and you have to do your steps and you have to do this and it becomes a dictatorship of health. And and sometimes when I hear in these conversations about healthcare that we can track everything, we have all these devices and and, and now there are insurance that you get lower premiums because you have achieved these things. I think we really need to watch out what we are creating here as, as a sort of society because we have amazing technologies but the question is do we need these technologies mm. like what is the quality of life when we start doing all these things the whole day oh i, I should only eat four grams now and i should mm. stop drinking and <laughs> we can do everything we can measure everything over time we can create data from everything the question is what do we need what do we want mm. to achieve and that's the interesting thing because like out of the perspective of the people selling these stuff like the iWatch or something yeah they are telling you you live longer if you use this uh this wearables in yeah. in, in in their way yeah? and that's that's basically something where we need to be critical exactly that's yeah. a powerful narrative yeah. yes definitely now um for me um not being an expert in the field we've now spent the last two days um talking about open source uh, bart this is uh three years for you now uh, and not just two days talking about open source every day and um and pushing it um and we, i've heard a lot about um democratizing and democratizing software code also and for me personally that is all still a little bit hard to understand what is actually meant by democratizing software code well i think from as i mentioned yesterday i think um, from all industries the only thing what really got democratized is, is software code like the way that you can you can access libraries uh, and you can dig into software code of others you can copy that and um, it's open source license and you can learn how he wrote that code you can try to add that you people share that again it's amazingly collaborative and mm -hmm. and and it's beautiful because people are co openly collaborating and, and, and the code is available. So it's like the letters of the alphabet that people can use to write books. It's just more complex. And I think uh, with software code, um, as it got democratized, uh, companies started to reinvent value creation. And if you look uh, like the cloud solutions of Amazon, IBM, Google, and Microsoft, um, they're... Um, if you look at the code stack, then more than 50% of the code is shared, like it's open source. The differentiation is on a, on a small level. So they have le they share the R&D cost, so open source can also be looked at a, as a shared collaborative R&D layer, where, and, and <coughs> in AI, I'll come to that later, that would create much more efficiencies that not everyone starts to train their own algorithm. Um, and so you have a shared thing that you start doing in a pre-competitive mode. But by doing so, you create faster standards, um, um, you create much more interoperability because you have these um, global standards that um, are based on the principle a bit of the survival of the fittest because nobody's telling what the standard is. People are creating open source and that the best wins, like the best project is being taken wow that's really interesting and, and so these things are, are, are non, not so much governed they are like really democratized they are um, um, grassrooted but the industry is also a large player which some people criticize but 
it gives others the possibility, and now in Germany we have in Heilbronn, uh, Dieter Schwarz is building up a huge cloud infrastructure because he wants to compete with Amazon, and he can only do that because a lot of the cl uh, cloud stacks are open sourced. Mm -hmm. and, and we would not have been competitive, we would not be able to, be to do so if all the open source infrastructure stack for a cloud would not be available for free to do that but you need to manage the services you need to orchestrate you have your sales you have your support all these things that you need that create value mm -hmm. but when it comes to democracy i mean sharing is only one aspect the other aspect is participation mm -hmm. and uh, when it comes to participation <coughs> then you need basically in the end much more people being code literate don't you yeah but yeah, who can the, read the code? Who can use the code? But, but that's do something digital literacy. Yeah. If we move, like I don't know if you saw my keynote yesterday, but I talked about the the the, the two spheres. Like we have the analog world and the digital sphere, and and we are transgressing to a digital sphere. And and I have my biological self, but I have my informational self. So that informational self lives in a digital sphere. That um, Today looks a bit more like the medieval um, uh, feudal systems where yeah, yeah. I don't own anything. I'm just for rent and I give everything. I don't have human rights. I have terms and conditions yeah. I need to accept. And I think these are the kind of things we need to work on that we create much more participations and we, meet, we need to create more commons. And there is one country that is leading this, is Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan is... is, is is pushing this really hard, and there is only re reason. I talked yesterday about the Death Star, not from Star Trek, from Star Wars. Star Wars, which is I, important. I, yes. I, I'm not going to make that mistake again. So, uh, and 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 the Death Star for Taiwan is China. So, and 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 what they learned as a government is that to create trust, because we didn't touch on anything about trust these two days, but interaction, uh, and the currency of interaction is, is trust. Yes. So without um, trust, you don't have interaction. So you have interaction between a government or big pharma or organizations and your mm. people and your consumers. And to be able to um, gain trust, uh, because China is always going in with fake news in Taiwan, they started to become more transparent and using participatory models. And mm. they're doing so much with civil ci civic um, 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 uh, civic science, and they, what, what I call it before, um, um, before, when I said you have public scientists, you have private scientists, and you have civic scientists. Civic yeah. scientists. Yeah. Civic scientists. And they do so much with civic scientists. They even ask the people, install things at your home to measure air quality. Everybody's contributing data. They do everything in a party. It's just beautiful. It's the digital democracy. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and they are reinventing democracy in, a, in that digital sphere. And they're creating a, a public common owned um, um, a data sphere together with the government. And, and, and I think we can learn a lot from, from that structure. Mm. Especially in Germany, everything goes still top down and not yeah. uh, bottom up. And I learned champagne bubbles go up. Uh, yes, we've heard that. And the today. fish thing from Kopf, no. <laughs> 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 yeah. How, how does that relate to your work? Because you do work in Germany for AI literacy. Um, are you faced with a lot of um, stuck up mentalities, um, if you go to schools, if you look at um, pioneering programs, could you tell us a little bit more um, how that looks in Germany right now? Yeah, of course. I mean, it's, it's pretty hard to come, uh, to come in with this comparably new content yeah. like data literacy or, or AI competencies when we are talking about schools because like mm -hmm. schools, they have their educational plans and they are quite standardized, not all over Germany, but in the, in the federal states. And it's the same basically in medicine. So they, it, it's, it's quite a classical uh, study way of studying. Yeah? And, and, and it's really hard to bring in some, mm -hmm. some new drive, some new content. Yeah? When we talk about medicine, you have the classical learning outcome standards and they are basically used all over Germany. Mm -hmm. And I think like in this learning outcome catalog, yeah. there's uh, AI only mentioned once uh, in, <laughs> in this whole catalog. And, and when it comes to digitalization, it's only five times. Yeah? That's, mm -hmm. um, that's absolutely absolutely crazy if we compare it to what's going on outside yeah? mm -hmm. and what kind of new technologies are coming in at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but can, can I ask you a question because I'm, I'm, 
ed education also has to do with uh, adoption in local local social cultural context how do you deal with this because what i learned in 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 my IBM time where IBM was pushing AI solutions from one institution in the US to the whole global world as there was one single guideline for everyone. How much adoption do you need for these countries and their learning content in, in the adopting it to cultural norms and and guidelines and to cultural norms, I basically don't know because, like, mainly we are operating at the moment in Germany or, or like Luxembourg or, or, or Switzerland, okay. yeah. So, so there are not that much cultural differences. But for example, when we are working in Switzerland and there we are, as I said, we are working together with the University of, of Basel, you see, they are, as you said, because it, that's not that much of a top-down approach yeah that's much more dynamic so we can really work as what we are like a research and development project yeah we can research and develop things yeah we can say lay, let's do a course and let's make a lecture on this and let's make it obligatory for for all uh, for, for for the students at this university that's basically not possible in germany it needs five i don't know a couple of years at least to get like maybe one university yeah saying we are going to do a lecture like all medical students need to do on data literacy and ai so more champagne bubbles in switzerland yeah, yeah i don't know <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <What a death. laughs> so they are always they are saying we are smaller smaller country and this is why processes are are easier to, direct to implement yeah so it's uh, but i don't know yeah i think we are basically just quite uh, as i said we are as you said we are more top down yeah, yeah it's, it's hard of over here basically to convince people yeah <laughs> like people in germany they have this highly critical thing there's something new coming basically they are not aware of using it but they are using it but when it comes to to reflect on it they immediately say i don't yeah i, I kind of don't like it yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, i lived 14 years in switzerland and it's really with these 26 cantons you have this bottom up the participatory yeah. again direct democracy and and it it, it feels so different um, um these and these are language wise similar cultures but um, um state wise totally different uh, infrastructures so it's really basically over here when you say do you want to try no yeah and mm. and in switzerland yeah why not let's try yeah, yeah. let's try and then yeah. and then grow grow yeah, up yeah, like yeah. and then but that that's the thing the difficulty is like with democratization is also means letting go of power huh? and and yeah. and that's with these fast transitions um, um, some have to lose and let go power um, and you see this in in agile organizations for example like agile organizations means that you give decision power to the teams that are actually building things and you don't need to guy four level ups to wait six months for an approval yeah. um, and and that's what makes it in germany quite <coughs> difficult in the automotive industry and others to be fast because there is this culture of yeah. um, a hierarchy which is very prussian uh, historical wise and i think these very fast changing environments need way more agility participation transparency and and horizontality, um, if you can, say, if if that even if it's a word, uh, I, horizontal structures. Yeah, I, I kind of like the approach from a social anthropologist called Claude Levi Strauss from from France, and uh, he divided like uh, societies into cold or cultures into cold and hot hot cultures. Yeah, as I, I lived. Uh, in, in China for a couple of years and I think they, are, they were really like uh, as I was there like a hot culture with high dynamics highly transformative uh, uh, energies going in there and like the cold cultures they are kind of really like frozen and it's really like hard to bring yeah. some innovation and some sort of energy and drive in it yeah, and so, so the, the thing is like what we need in Germany we have to become at least at some certain stage like a hotter culture so or society. How do you bring that in, in your education program? <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a really good question. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe to be really positive and like we. I mean, it's always about creating nar narratives, like positive stories about mm -hmm. things. Yeah, and I think it's always to have like this positive stories, these use cases, really problem based to bring it into into this critical. Uh, a culture and kind of opening them up. 
it's a bit of a of a, of a contradiction because before we said we have to watch out from the narratives of big tech and we have to be critical. Yeah, that's that's really it's it's we have yeah yeah we have to see where we have to be critical and maybe yeah and this is all about education yeah um, um, if you know things you can be pragmatic in some sort of way and critic in another as well if you if you see through now, these now things, as, yeah. as a last yeah. very positive yeah. thing we need positive yes. stories yeah. like there is a ai index for democratic values that indexes 50 countries and you know who is on position one last year uh, two years ago and now number two germany so um, and, and it's AI and democratic values is, 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 is really Canada, Italy, and Germany, the top three. That's and the US is placed 23. That's, so. a good, that's, yeah, a, that's a good, that's a very good yeah. fact uh, for the end of our day, um, because we do have to slowly wrap it up. Um, and we've arrived at the bird eye view, uh, talking about democratization, uh, about data literacy, about culture. Um, and I think that's a good thing because for me, um, I've learned so much during the last two days um, also about um, the urgency of, of data regulation and what data actually is and what it is all about. Um, and for me also what, I've, what, I've, what I'm going to take away is that, that it's not, we're not uh, about um, fighting a certain system. It's not, it's not about fighting capitalism or a certain industry. Uh, it's about collaborating and it's about opening up, um, building bridges. Um, I think that was an interesting story you told about um, your conversation with the CEO of Roche. Um, that's that's what, I, what I really remember, that it's not about uh, communism either. It's just about building bridges, opening up um, and sharing values and creating values uh, together, not just a, a bunch of companies, but everybody um, that is involved in health and healthcare. And so, yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thanks for watching. Um, all of this will be uploaded. So if you have missed something, uh, you can find it um, next next week. I think we're going to upload. Um, you will find it at Bart's blog. It's at blog.hippoai.org. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. I hope you enjoy your weekend. That's it from me. Um, and maybe Bart, uh, you have something to say as well. Yes, um, um, I've um, enjoyed this extremely. I'm, I'm taking the challenge eight weeks ago. So like, let's do this. <laughs> yeah. I'm completely not ID, but um, I got quite some f uh, feedback on my um, uh, channels. And I, I really wish, and for the audience, if people want to contribute, I want to. I miss the audience, and um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I think we need to do this next year in a, a live setting, bringing all these people from Europe together, um, and create a, a platform that brings uh, creators and open-minded people together to uh, enforce these, like not enforce, to um, um, empower people to to think more open and, and collaborate in the open. And I think. That's what we're gonna do. Like, um, if we can do eight weeks this, then we can in twelve months we can do something else. So, <laughs> yes. Um, so. And you wanted to wear a hippo suit, so maybe we'll. Don't tell maybe, it. Yeah. Maybe we'll see. It. Okay, so we'll have to think of a different suit. Um, yeah. yeah. We had the boobs this. Now year, we had. So, yeah, okay. we did have the boobs. Um, and next year we'll have something yeah. different. Well, thank you very much. It's been great pleasure, um, and I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.